getting better but still not clear I hope my voice is uh, reaching you. Now it is clear. Please respond so that First of all, we shall discuss International Accounting Standard 22. Then uh, we shall discuss International Financial Institutions 29. And payment, I separated in payment area so that I could help you people practically how can you apply the guidelines given uh, in payment when you are uh, new requirements of the payment. So that you could appreciate the difference, but in fact, uh, you are required to apply the new requirements. So that's why we shall be discussing the uh, impairment area separately. Then we shall be discussing hedging area separately. And at the end, uh, we shall cover IFRS 7, due to the disclosures of the uh, financial instruments. Uh, we are uh, taking almost nine hours to uh, cover financial instruments, but uh, the depth of uh, the topic is such that nine hours may not be sufficient. So that's why I try to uh, select uh, those areas uh, where we can uh, discuss and uh, we can conclude construct. So that whatever we discuss, that, that is not only understandable, but that should give you benefit in your practical life. So we shall be taking up those matters from 32, IFS 9 and 7, uh, which are which are really helpful, uh, help, helpful for many people while uh, applying these guidelines uh, practically. Uh, I would like to share uh, one more thing, and I am thankful to Almighty Allah as well. Uh, actually, so far as the impairment and hedging is concerned, uh, uh, I was given an opportunity to represent uh, Pakistan uh, last year. Uh, I, uh, I uh, presented impairment and hedging uh, in Pakistan last year. Uh, and uh, that conference was attended by around 1,000 people. 263 uh, audit firms all uh, over the uh, and, uh, given me the opportunity to represent Pakistan and to present financial instruments, especially focusing on impairment and hedging and other main changes in the financial instrument and how it affects uh, 
done in any industry. What, what, what should be done? What, what should be uh, the take in order to uh, implement uh, the guidelines uh, given in the time? Currently, in fact, they are applying in the public standard 39. So, So, we have a notebook and we are ready uh, just to uh, install the implementations. Uh, so, that uh, you could appreciate the, uh, like, uh, the concept there and then. Where when this is in the public presentation, it's very be attended and the process are completely done. So, it is uh, uh, if you are sitting in uh, groups, uh, uh, keep point so that uh, the meeting of other people uh, is not impaired. And uh, similarly, you can ask questions. We will be having a uh, frequent uh, break. I will try to take your question uh, uh, when I think that I have uh, discussed uh, a concept. Answer your question uh, right after that particular concept so that any confusion can be uh, addressed uh, immediately. Okay, so first of all, financial instruments. See, financial instruments. Financial instruments is basically a contract. It gives rise to a financial asset of one and uh, a financial liability or instrument of an other entity. It's basically a contract, and on one side you will find financial assets of an entity, and on the other side, a financial liability or an when we talk about the assets and the liabilities, the statement of financial position immediately comes to our mind. But the language describes financial statement as contracts, financial instruments as contracts, and therefore, in a sense, financial assets, financial liabilities, equity instruments. Going to be pieces of paper. So let me check with the voice again, once again. Lots of people are saying that uh, they cannot hear us. Please let me know uh, that, uh, rather, some people are saying that voice is not clear. Please tell us that, that if you can hear us clearly, uh, I need a little feedback from you guys. Voice is not clear, uh, not clear, breaking. Okay, let me uh, read it with my other audio
financial asset of one entity and financial liability or equity instrument of other entity. This is basically a contract. See, with reference to assets, liabilities, and equity instruments, the statement of financial position comes to mind. But the definition <coughs> describes the financial instruments as contracts. And therefore, in a sense, financial liabilities and equity instruments are going to be uh, pieces of paper. See, for example, when an invoice is uh, uh, issued on the sale of goods on credit, the entity that has sold the goods has a financial asset, that is the receivable. When you sell goods on credit, so receivable is created. So this receivable is your financial asset. While the buyer has to account for a financial liability. A payable. Another example is when an entity raises finance by issuing equity shares. See, the entity that subscribes the shares as a financial asset because they have invested, that entity has invested in the shares of another company. This investment is their asset, is its asset. So this is their financial asset. Why the issuer of the shares who raised finance has to account for an equity uh, instrument, equity share capital. The third example is when an entity raises finance by issuing bonds, debentures, the entity that subscribes to the bonds mean that lends the money has a finance asset, an investment. While the issuer of the bonds, that is uh, the borrower who has raised the finance, has to account for the bonds as a financial liability. So when we talk about uh, accounting for financial instruments, in simple terms, we are really talking about is how we account for investment in shares, investment in bonds and receivables, and how we account for trade payables and long-term loans, financial liabilities, and how we account for equity share capital, mean equity instruments. So these are the basically financial instruments like your receiver, your payable, your long-term debt, your like uh, equity instrument, and then uh, like uh, investment in bonds, investment in shares, your account receivable, your account payable, all these are financial instruments. Okay. We can uh, look at some of the examples of, uh, you can look at the, some of the examples of uh, financial instruments. Financial instruments are basically like, for example, as I mentioned earlier, trade receiver. This is the trade receiver. This is financial asset of one party. Whereas uh, another party uh, who, will, who will be paying this money, who has bought the goods from this uh, first party, for them, this is a financial liability. We saw the definition. Like for one party, the financial instrument will be a financial asset. And for the other party, this will be either financial liability or an equity instrument. This is the first example. Second is like if one party has invested in shares, this investment is basically an asset for that organization. Whereas the other entity uh, who issued those shares, so this will become the equity instrument of uh, that other party. Similarly, holder of redeemable preference shares. So, who's
uh, peak the impact. Now, the question arises, we have discussed the given preference shares here. Again, we are discussing here. Here you can see that these are uh, classified as a financial liability, whereas here these are classified as the uh, equity instrument. Though we shall be uh, discussing this concept at length uh, after some slides, but uh, only uh, very shortly, very shortly. See, uh, we all know that renewable preference shares uh, can be uh, uh, can be or they can so what what are the techniques uh, which will be used what are the techniques which is which is having money while deciding whether a renewable preference share is a liability or equity we shall be discussing this concept after some slide but for here you can see that this is a financial asset for one party and equity instrument of two party. So you can uh, hear me now clearly. Uh, I suppose just answer with yes, so that quickly uh, we can see that instead of keep on discussing, we should have your feedback so that we uh, can see that. Next is another example is finance lease receivables. Finance lease receivables. See, finance lease receivable. Uh, these are basically financial asset of one party, whereas financial liability of finance lease obligation is basically financial liability of. The leasing company. We can see that, like uh, in case of lease, if uh, these are receivable, this is your uh, uh, financial asset, and uh, anything payable under lease will be your financial liability. Receivable means you are a lesser, and for lesser. Uh, finance lease and operating lease terms uh, are retained by the International Financial Agency. So, receivable uh, under operating lease, receivable under uh, finance uh, lease, basically financial assets uh, and uh, uh, payable on the part of your lessee will be uh, financial liability for your lessee. Financial liability for your lessee. Likewise, some of uh, these are the basically examples of these are basically examples of uh, uh, financial uh, instruments from all these examples we have noted that on one side it was a financial asset on one side and on another side it was either a financial liability or an equity instrument this was one. Second, financial instrument can be a primary instrument and financial instrument can be a derivative instrument. As we have seen in uh, before these examples, it was written over here, like financial instruments include primary instruments and, and derivative instruments that derives its value from the price or rate of an underlying instrument. All these examples, which we have just discussed, these were the example of the primary instruments, in fact. Now we can see a couple of examples related to uh, financial instruments, which are basically uh, derivative instruments, which are basically derivative instruments. These were the examples of the primary instruments so these are the examples of uh, directive instrument so here you can see that buyer of in the money options in the money of your option if you are buyer and your option is in the money you are buyer so this is financial asset for you this is financial and on the uh, on the other side for that on the other side 
wrote this option for, for that organization this will become the financial liability for that organization this will become the financial liability we know that what is in the money option in the money option what is in that you will in the money option you will make profit if you exercise that profit if so that is normally termed as in the money option like if you have uh, if you have an option if you buy dollar at the rate of one hundred and ten. So if if uh, open market rate is one hundred twenty rupees, so this means by by exercising that option, you can buy one dollar with one hundred ten, and you can sell that dollar uh, at one hundred twenty. So this will give you a profit of rupees ten per dollar. So this option uh, will be termed as in the money option. So if you are a buyer of in the money option, if you hold this option, so this is your financial asset. But the other party who wrote this option, who is the, uh, uh, which is the seller of this option, for that party, this is basically uh, a, uh, like uh, a financial land. So this is one example. Another example is, forward contract standing at pay. If you have entered into a forward contract with, uh, which, is, which is a bank or other financial institution or other organization, and you, you people know that the rate in the forward contract is fixed. So uh, the rate which is fixed may be uh, beneficial for you by uh, like, uh, exercising like uh, by, by executing that forward contract you will gain uh, so that that will become your financial asset but the other party the other party of course uh, will be at loss if you are at gain that party will be at loss uh, we can reverse this situation as well if you uh, have already entered into a forward contract and that is at loss for you that is at loss for you so of course the other party uh, the other party to the contract will be will be at gain automatically. For for that other party, this forward contract will become financial asset, and for you, this forward contract will become financial liability. Okay. So then here are see in brief, uh, financial instrument in fact give you present right. To receive cash on other, or another financial asset and contractual in nature, not imposed by some statutory requirements. So these two things are very important. Like either you receive cash or you receive another financial asset. See, this is this is basically this is basically the understanding. This is basically the understanding like which we must uh, keep in mind like this will be contractual in nature there will be a contract automatically when we say that there should be a contract so if something is imposed by the statute requirement this will not be become the part of this this cannot be treated as a financial instrument so we can have a couple of examples related to this like inventories property uh, plant and equipment leased assets, intangible assets are not financial instrument because their control does not give rise to present right to receive cash. I repeat, because their control does not give rise to uh, present right to receive cash or another financial asset. Similarly, prepaid uh, expense mean future benefits in that uh, that will result in the uh, receipt of future goods or services mean rather than I mean, this is this is basically this will also not a financial instrument prepaid expenses prepayments because in future you will be receiving either goods or services so for financial instrument uh, the other side should be a cash you will be receiving a cash or another financial asset so these two things if you are receiving so then this will be termed as a financial instrument otherwise not 
Similarly, deferred revenue and most warranty obligations are not financial liabilities because the outflow of economic benefits associated with them is the delivery of goods and services rather than a contractual obligation to pay cash or other financial assets. Similarly, liabilities or assets that are not contractual, that are not contractual, such as income taxes that are created as a result of statutory requirements imposed by the government and are not financial liabilities or financial assets. Accounting for income taxes we know is dealt uh, under International Accounting Standard 12. Similarly, uh, constructive obligations as defined in International Accounting Standard 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets do not arise from contracts and are not financial liabilities. Okay, if you people have any question, so please feel free to uh, ask that question before moving to the next uh, area. I suppose the definition is very clear for one party, simply uh, trade receivables, trade payables, loans, long-term loans, bonds, debentures, equity uh, instruments, if you have invested in the shares, all these are financial instruments because all these are contractual in nature. All these are contractual in nature and when they will be settled, uh, either you will be receiving or paying cash or other financial assets. So these are the financial instruments, uh, in fact. Okay, if we... Uh, yes, we have a question from, uh, uh, I think, Mr. Muhammad Bakir. I would like to ask what about transition of forward contracts to swaps? How should there be, how should they be defined? either as a financial liability at first and asset later, just confused with its definition and subsequent accounting treatment. Which, which contract? Which contract, uh, Muhammad Bakir? Uh, transition of forward contracts to swaps. See, forward contract uh, are derivative instrument. When you uh, convert it, to the swap swap is again a, a derivative instrument so be clear both are financial instrument both are financial instrument bucket i hope it is clear uh, can you kindly explain redeemable preference shares again as there was severe voice disruption at that time uh, who is this gentleman uh, mariam Malati. mariam uh, i will be discussing uh, redeemable preference shares at length after a few slides because in those slides we saw like uh, uh, in one uh, like line we uh, classified them as a financial liability whereas after a couple of lines we classified uh, redeemable preference shares as equity instrument so we shall be discussing this concept uh, like uh, after a few slides so there you will find your answer Mohammed Ahmed Sadiqi asking if advances paid or security deposits can be classified as uh, as financial assets. Uh, who is this gentleman? Uh, Mohammed Ahmed Sadiqi. Mohammed Ahmed, simple criteria is very simple. If your whenever you get your security back, you will be receiving cash or other financial asset, and that is contractual in nature. Yes, you can. Uh, for options does not give a clear present obligation for options where it does not give a clear present obligation but rather the facility to impose so how it will be considered as a financial instrument under first criteria who is this gentleman achala Kuleka. achala can you uh, elaborate your question because uh, options are uh, option could be of uh, uh, three types, like at any particular uh, and at any point in time, like uh, an option could be in the money, an option could be uh, at the money, an option could be out of the money. So what you are talking about, so please uh, uh, be clear in your question so that I could answer. Okay, so uh, 
Okay, fine. So we can we can move forward. Yes, 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 please. He is asking what are the core factors that determines a financial instrument and what is the nature of contract? Nature of contract, see, uh, uh, Burhanuddin, uh, contract uh, in the general context of the contract, there is no like uh, uh, there is a, any um, like a special definition for the contract as you people have learned from the contract law. I mean, uh, your contract, if it is entered into as per uh, uh, the requirement of uh, that law, so that that, that, that is a contract. I mean, uh, as per the contract law, I mean, this is a like a common law concept. So it has, uh, uh, there is uh, nothing special uh, related to the financial instrument. So the same contract as per the common law concept. Burhan, I hope it is clear. Uh, all options give rise to financial instruments. Please elaborate, Usman Yusuf. Uh, yes, Usman. All options, all options uh, give rise to financial instrument. Because if an option is out of the money for you, so this is your financial leverage. Uh, no, in that case, uh, if you like, uh, Usman, let me uh, take up three situations separately. If an option is in the money, this is like a financial asset for you and financial liability for the, uh, for the writer of the option. You are the buyer of the option. If an option is out of the money, so it is neither financial asset nor financial liability for you because it is neither as financial asset nor financial liability for you. So uh, for other party, uh, the same will be the case. For other party, it will be neither financial asset nor financial liability. If it is at the money, the same is the case I, as, as I discussed, uh, but it depends how it moves. If it will subsequently move in the money, then this will become uh, financial instrument for you if you are a uh, writer, uh, if you are a buyer of that option. Usman, I hope it is clear. I mean, there could be different situation and under each situation, uh, you can decide whether it is a financial instrument or not, because for financial instrument, it has, it has uh, got to be financial asset for one and the financial liability of other. If an option is out of the money, so this is uh, not beneficial for you. This is not an asset for you if it is not an asset for you so we will not be thinking about the other party because you will not be exercising the right of a writer of the option will not have to uh, meet any obligation or even if, if you exercise it which is which is uh, illogical and which is uh, irrelevant so then that will be a beneficial for the other party uh, be before moving to another question usman please uh, uh, if you are clear then i could move further or if you have any specific question you can ask. Before going further on, uh, on another question, uh, one of the member uh, appearing to me as offline, I don't know from which medium they can uh, see our webinar, but uh, anyhow, uh, he's asking uh, that uh, uh, at my end, I am getting message that organizer have muted, I cannot hear. Although uh, people can hear us, but uh, they cannot uh, speak through their uh, mic. So we have muted their mic from our end. And uh, I think he's getting the message of his mic right now. So other people can hear and they are even posting their questions as well. So we have a question from uh, Achala Pereira again. My question is whatever the type of the option uh, it does not give a current obligation to the buyer, only a right to impose. So it may not satisfy the first criteria you have given in the slide. Achala, I suppose I pronunciated it correctly. Achala, see, let me let me explain it to you. Like if we use one uh, empty page from here. Okay, where is it? from here 
See, a chala for option for each option for each option there could be a buyer of that option and there will be a seller of that option or you can name it writer of that option writer of that option if you have an option to buy one dollar for rupees one one zero you are the buyer of this option you can buy one dollar for rupees one one zero in the open market if dollar rate is open market dollar rate is like move to rupees 118 so will you exercise this option or not of course you will exercise and who will be honoring this option when you will be exercising of course the writer of that option so if at the year end you are holding an option which is in the money this is your financial asset because as per the definition of the asset this will give you a benefit of 8 rupees per dollar but for the writer he he is obliged to like uh, sell you dollar at the rate of 110 so option if if option if you are if you are a buyer of an option which is in the money at the year end or at the period end this will become your financial asset and the financial liability of the other party because you are buyer this is optional for you but for the writer of the option this is binding for him he will have to settle that transaction if the buyer a buyer of the option requires this i hope it is clear can you please check it if it is clear uh, then yes okay okay let's move further hmm let's move further here we were here international uh, accounting standard 32 first of all uh, certain items are excluded from uh, uh, from the scope of international accounting standard 32 number one is uh, like uh, interest in subsidiaries so you will be treating that interest in subsidiaries in accordance with ias 27 and interest in associates that you will be treating under international accounting standard 28 and then interest in joint ventures that you will be treating under international accounting standard 31 and pensions and other post employment benefits that will be treated under international accounting standard 19 and insurance contracts there is a separate con uh, uh, contract for the insurance and then contracts for contingent consideration uh, in a business combination and uh, last week we uh, covered the consolidation there we discussed this point so this will not be covered under international accounting standard 32 then contracts that require that require a pay a payment based on climate climatic geological or other physical variables and financial instruments contracts and obligation under share based payment transactions under share based payment transaction if it is a share based payment transaction that falls uh, under the ambit of international accounting uh, international financial reporting standard 
So that financial instrument will be treated as per IFRS 2. Okay. So international accounting standard 32 should be applied in the presentation of all types of financial instrument, whether recognized or unrecognized and uh, accept these uh, financial uh, these instruments which are excluded in fact okay some important terminologies uh, equity instrument we know that like equity instrument any contract that evidences a residual interest in the asset of an entity after deducting all of its liabilities after deducting all of its liabilities and then fair value the amount for which an asset could be exchanged or liability settled between knowledgeable willing parties in the arm's length transaction and then putable instruments a financial instrument that gives the holder the right to put the instrument back to the issuer for cash or another financial asset or is automatically put back to the issuer on occurrence of an uncertain future event or the death or retirement of the instrument holder so the learning objective for international accounting standard 32 is uh, two i will try and i'm very confident inshallah that uh, after we finish our discussion uh, of international accounting standard 32 uh, we should be able to differentiate between debt and equity or we uh, will inshallah successfully refresh your earlier concept of differentiation between debt and equity. Second, uh, the segregation of debt and equity components of compound hybrid instrument on initial uh, recognition. These are the two uh, basically learning objective from uh, our discussion of international accounting standard uh, 32. Okay. Then, first of all, first of all, how to differentiate between debt and uh, equity? See, the fundamental principle is that a financial instrument should be classified as either a financial liability or an equity instrument according to the substance of the transaction, not its legal form and the definition of financial liability and equity instrument, mean substance over form. Okay. There could be a couple of exceptions. So, uh, but except those exceptions, you will be applying the general principle which we shall be discussing in these slides. Financial liability is the contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset. Equity is basically is any contract that evidences a residual interest in the entity's assets after deducting all its liabilities. So these are the basic definition okay first of all let's discuss uh, the examples of equity ordinary shares of course equity these are the equity elements uh, instruments see in ordinary shares all the payments are at the discretion of the issuer so then preference shares required to be converted into a fixed number of ordinary shares on a fixed date or on the occurrence of an event that is certain to occur should be classified as equity should be classified as equity then next is a contract that will be settled by entity in receiving or delivering a fixed number of its own equity instrument in exchange for a fixed amount of cash or another financial asset 
is an equity instrument. This has been called the fixed for fixed requirement. Fixed for fixed requirement. So this means generally this fixed for fixed requirement will be applicable with a couple of exceptions. Mean you will have to apply the fixed for fixed requirement principle in order to establish whether an instrument uh, is an equity or a liability, except a couple of exceptions. See, preference shares uh, like where uh, they are required to be converted into a fixed number of uh, shares at a fixed date, uh, then uh, these will be classified as equity. Note one thing here, like rights issues, when the price is denominated in, uh, in a currency other than the entity's functional currency. Why? Because in this case, fixed for fixed principal requirement is not being met. So one can think that if like uh, you are an American company, you are an American company and your basically functional currency is dollar and your subsidiary is incorporated in Pakistan and your subsidiary's functional currency is basically rupees. And if you have announced right issue in Pakistan and people will be uh, like uh, paying the price of those shares in the form of rupees. So there is, there is always a risk like due to changes in the exchange rate, the amount you will receive in the form of dollar may be different from the amount which you, sh uh, you sh could have received at the date of the announcement of that uh, right issue. So here apparently it seems that fixed for fixed requirement principle is, uh, uh, is not uh, being met. But please note this exception, right issue can still be classified as equity when the price is denominated in a currency other than the entity's functional currency. The price of the right is denominated in currency other than uh, the issuer's functional currency when the entity is listed in more than one jurisdiction or is required to do so by law or regulation, a fixed price in a non-functional currency would normally fail the fixed number of uh, share for a fixed amount of cash requirement in International Accounting Standard 32 to be treated as equity instrument. As a result, it is treated as an exception in International Accounting Standard 32 and therefore treated as liability. Okay, so now comes to the debt. Debt. If there is any variability in the demand, in the, in the amount of cash or on equity instrument that will be delivered or received, then such a contract is a financial asset or liability as applicable. For example, where a contract requires the entity to deliver as many of the entities on equity instruments as are equal in value to a certain amount, the holder of the contract would be indifferent whether it received cash or shares to the value of that amount. Thus, this contract would be treated as debt, as a liability. If an entity issues preference shares that pay a fixed rate of dividend and that have a mandatory redemption feature at a future date, the substance is that they are contractual obligation to deliver cash and therefore should be recognized as a liability. But please note that preference shares that do not have a fixed maturity and where the issuer does not have a contractual obligation to make any payment are equity. 
see even though instruments are legally termed preference shares mariam i i suppose you ask this question see why we classified two preference shares separately uh mean a preference share could be an equity instrument or it could be financial liability see if preference shares do not have a fixed maturity and the issuer do, does not have a contractual obligation to make any payment then these preference shares are equity instrument on the other side if uh, like uh, the entity issues preference shares that pay a fixed rate of dividend and that have a mandatory redemption feature at a future date then this that these uh, redeemable preference shares will be classified as a financial liability mariam i hope your question is your earlier question is answered okay uh, one of the member mohammed bai here saying sir no, no, just about... just just hold just hold just hold let yes. me finish uh, a part of yes 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 okay uh, okay fine fine no uh, just let me finish with a couple of slide to finish the discussion of the debt and the equity then we can uh, like take up your question okay so see you need to consider other factors as well like redemption option means that is there a limited life to the instrument then uh, is redemption triggered by a future uncertain event that is beyond the control of both the holder and issuer of the instrument and are dividends uh, like uh, non discretionary so you have to consider these factors if any of these factors uh, is there so you can treat it as uh, as debt okay then the next question is at what time we should uh, classify an instrument as a debt or equity instrument so please note that at the time of initial recognition and you are not allowed to change this classification subsequently due to changes in the circumstances whereby for example you have initially classified an instrument as a financial liability based on the factor we have just discussed but subsequently due to changes in the circumstances you realized that no it it is an equity instrument so you are not allowed to change this classification so you you will have to decide it at your uh, at 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 the initial recognition further exception is like i was discussing about the exception the exception is basically some financial in, financial instruments that currently meet the definition of financial liability will be classified as equity because they represents the residual interest in the net assets of the entity this exception is not related to the classification this exception is like i earlier mentioned like though right issue does not fulfill the fix for fix uh, requirement even then you will be classifying the right issue as equity instrument so this is the second exception uh, exception see some instruments normally they meet the definition of the financial liability but they are treated as uh, uh, equity instrument why because they represent the residual interest in the asset of the entity what is the example example is portable financial instrument representing the Uh, residual interest in the net asset of the entity see instruments or components of instrument that impose uh, on the entity an obligation to deliver another party a pro rata share of the net assets of the entity only on liquidation so these are termed as portable financial instrument uh, 
portable financial instrument are classified as equity instrument though they uh, apparently meet the definition of the uh, debt instrument though they apparently meet the definition of the debt instrument okay before moving to another learning objective so i uh, can uh, answer your question so mr khayam would you please help me uh, in uh, yes mohammad bad ki saying so what about shareholders uh, director fund uh, what what should be the treatment for the same will it be equity sorry sorry again uh, what about the shareholder oblique director fund what should be the treatment for the same will it be equity uh, shareholder so please can you clarify your question because uh, director fund what do you mean by director fund uh are there any shares involved in in it or is there any options or things like this if uh, you are talking about uh, director share option schemes uh, of course uh, if uh, those are equity settled those are equity settled then these are basically equity instruments but uh, mean that fulfills the definition of the equity instrument but as we have seen Uh, in the uh, scope exclusion that uh, these will be treated these are equity instrument but these will be treated in accordance with international financial reporting standard 2 i i hope this was your question uh, how to account for uh, convertible financial instrument attached with uncertain conditions how to account for if other way around takes place which we initially recognized to small user Usman Yusuf, you are talking about a convertible instrument. So we are uh, about to start discussion on convertible instrument in a while. Next question. Okay, uh, Sadia Aslam saying an example of such an exception for financial instrument which meets the definition of financial liability but is in fact an equity. Uh, Sadia uh, example is. portable uh, financial instrument you can note it portable portable p u w t a b l e portable financial instrument see an entity shall classify a financial instrument as an equity instrument from the date when the instrument has all the features uh, and, and meets the conditions set out in uh, in the in the standard so answer of your question is portable financial instrument in fact portable financial instrument represent the residual interest in the assets of the company and it imposes these instruments impose uh, on the entity an obligation to de to deliver uh, to another party a pro rata share of the net assets of the entity only on liquidation i hope it is clear next Okay, we have another question from Usman Yusuf. If any arrangement is made which does not require investment in shares or equity instrument, but gives residual interest in the assets of the company, then uh, it will be classified as equity. Yes, of course, it will be classified. Anything which provides you a residual interest uh, in the company. Sadia saying thanks and uh, Burhanuddin. Sadia, you are welcome. Burhan, yes. Burhanuddin saying if an entity enters into a contract to sell goods to another party on credit, it will give rise to trade uh, receivables for one party and trade payables for another party. We account for this contract in accordance with IFRS 15. What is the difference between this contract in terms of IFRS 15 and IS 32? See, Burhanuddin. so far as the recognition of the amount is concerned and so far as the uh, so far as like uh, you need to decide should you recognize revenue related to those goods is there a contract all these questions will be answered under ifrs 50 but once you made an entry like debtors debit 
and revenue credit. Thereafter, these debtors will become your financial asset and will be treated in accordance with IFRS 9. But to the point you made this entry, I mean uh, like debtor debit, revenue credit, you will be applying IFRS 15. Once you made this entry, subsequently these debtors will be treated in accordance with IFRS 9. No, uh, no, no. I hope it's clear. No more questions are there. Okay, but... fine. We can uh, move to the uh, next question. Uh, Rajendra is saying yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Rajendra is saying please give examples of equity instrument other than investment in shares. But in shares, uh, Usman, see, uh, there could be such instruments like I uh, like uh, A category shares, B category shares, like those shares, uh, uh, those shareholders who cannot uh, like participate uh, in the decision making process, other categories of shares, uh, which are not uh, like, uh, like uh, whose holder cannot participate in the decision making process, mean there are other classification of shares, uh, which are equity in fact, because uh, uh, they're uh, like, uh, like uh, return is the dividend, uh, and the residual interest in the asset of the company. Otherwise, they are not involved in the decision making and they do not have some other rights as well. So uh, these are basically the instrument uh, which uh, are basically equity instrument. Okay, now let's move further. The second learning objective of International Accounting Standard 32. See, if uh, an organization issues a hybrid instrument like someone uh, gave the example of convertible their international accounting standard 32 requires i'm sure we all we are all clear about hybrid or hybrid instrument hybrid instrument is in fact is an instrument which provides you uh, provides uh, the holder an option to receive cash or the equity shares of the issuing entity. I mean, there is an option. Like either you can go for cash or you can uh, like uh, go for shares. So such instrument is termed as hybrid instrument. I mean, with two options. So International Accounting Standard 32 requires that hybrid instrument should be recorded by separating the debt and equity element. First of all, debt element is calculated and the equity portion is residual value. For example, if company received uh, cash rupees 3000 on issuance of a convertible uh, instrument and the company calculated debt element as 2500 rupees then the equity element will be the residual amount, which is 500 rupees. I repeat it again. My example was, if a company issue an instrument and receive rupees 3000 cash, in order to initially recognize this instrument, the entity measures the debt element as 2500 rupees. So, the remaining amount mean the difference of 3000 and the debt element of 2500 will become the uh, equity element and we know uh, the entry for this will be very uh, simple the entry will be the entry will be like uh, debit entry will be debit cash debit cash and credit 2500 to equity uh, sorry 2500 to debt and 500 to liability this will be the uh, simple entry for uh, this transaction okay
Okay, what are the simple steps for segregation of debt and uh, uh, like equity? First is determine, calculate future cash flows attached to that hybrid or compound instrument. Assuming that cash will be paid on redemption. Assuming that cash will be paid on redemption. This is step number one actual cash flows then is step number two before moving to step number two we can apply step number one on this small example if an entity issues three thousand six percent Convertible debenture of rupees 1000 each at par for a period of three years, which will be redeemed either at par or 250 shares against each convertible debentures. The market rate or effective rate of interest is 9%. What are the future cash flows attached to convertible debenture? So please. Uh, do the calculation and uh, we can make it as a pop-up question. I can give you a couple of options uh, to uh, choose from, to opt from. What are the future cash flows, either in the form of interest or uh, capital repayment at the end of uh, the instrument uh, period, instrument term. We shall be popping up a question. Can I make you write that question? You just uh, give me a moment because I'm going to do that very minute. Yes. What question do you want me to write a question statement? Yes. Uh, what are the future cash flows attached to the convertible debt? What are the future cash flows attached to the to the convertible debt? Convertible debentures. Debentures. Okay. Okay. Option one. Yes. Interest payment, interest payment. two hundred and seventy thousand two seven tetra zero. Okay. And in the same option. Okay. And principal three million. Three million. Option two. Okay. Interest payment. 180,000 per year. Okay. And 3 million principal. So these are the two options. So just answer the correct uh, option. I suppose you people have downloaded the slides. So when the question is popped up, you can look at those slides so on yeah. slide number 23. Uh, when uh, the pop-up question is uh, on the screen, you guys cannot see the presentation. So in the meantime, you have to participate in the poll question. Uh, the presentation uh, will come back again once the poll question is closed. Thank you. But because I suppose you have downloaded that presentation, so you can go to slide number 23 to just relook at that example before answering this uh, poll question. So far, only 9% No, 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 please come up. Please come up. 
because this is important uh, like uh, subject all the handouts are also available at google doc link so uh, all the attendees can download it from the google doc link that we have provided them already so it is better we should keep quiet for a while so that they could think out their answers Okay, 30, 30 seconds are left. So far, 16% people have participated in the poll. Only 20 seconds left now. I'm going to close the poll question in a bit. So you have to submit your answers right away, <coughs> please come up with your answers and submit it. Now only 10 seconds left. Okay, so I'm going to close this poll now. Okay, I have closed the poll. And uh, we have 53% people saying uh, payment of interest to like 70,000 per year and uh, principal 3 million while 47% people saying in the interest payment of 180,000 per year and uh, principal amount 3 million. 47% uh, are correct. See, example is in front of you. Your cash payment is always based on uh, the nominal interest rate, the coupon interest rate, which is 6%. Cash is always paid on this coupon rate of interest or nominal rate of interest. So far as the market rate of interest is concerned or the effective rate of interest is concerned, this is not the basis for the uh, payment of the cash. In fact, if I have issued bonds, at the time of issuance, if I mentioned in, in, in the bond uh, document that we shall be paying like 6% uh, of uh, face value, like here in this case, like 3 million. So subsequently, whatever is the market rate, whatever is the effective interest rate, that has nothing to do so far as the calculation of the cash payment interest uh, payment is concerned. So this means 47% are uh, correct. Okay. This was step number one. Okay, now move to step number two. Step number two is basically discount future cash flows using a market rate or effective rate of interest. So this is this is basically the uh, like. Uh, utilization of the market or effective rate of interest so this will be used for for like for the calculation of the present value of future cash flows which we which we determined under step number one so here what we did so this was step number so what we can do here like we can see that if I use uh, an empty page, okay. So this is this is the page available. See here we can see that if we mention over here like uh, here.
cash flows cash flows okay, let me come down here yeah. cash flows and then uh, discount factor discount factor and then the present value present value present value see at the end of year one then at the end of year two then at the end of year uh, three what 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 will be the cash for us this is a uh, this is a debt instrument so see uh, for us uh, at the end of first year there will be an outflow of 180000 means 6% into 3 million this will give us the interest payment so this is outflow in first year and the same will be the outflow in second year and in third year of course we shall be repaying we are assuming here as i mentioned in step number 1 as if this instrument will be settled in cash so if this will be settled in cash, then at the end of third year, uh, your cash outflow will be uh, this amount. So discount factor, always remember, we shall be discounting these cash flows using effective interest rate or market rate of interest. So which is given, which is here 9%. So when we apply this, uh, discount factor so this will give us some value over here and when we total it so this will give us uh, 2772183 so this is basically the debt element debt element within this hybrid instrument this is the debt element Okay, if we move further, equity element will be equal to equity element will be equal to equity element will be equal to in fact equity. Let me move to the next page. Okay, fine. So equity element. equity is equal to the 3 million which we received in the form of cash minus this debt element as we calculated so this means equity element is 227817 so our general entry for uh, recording uh, this compound and instrument will be like we have received cash or van preferably account 3 million then credit uh, debt account or liability financial liability you can term it as a financial liability 2772 one eight three and credit equity reserve so this will give us two two seven eight one seven this is the double entry for uh, uh, initial uh, recognition of hybrid instrument This was the step number two. And then I uh, like, uh, then we discussed the double entry as well. 
see this is a small illustration so we shall be using this small illustration because it involves only two years so you can uh, perform calculations very quickly uh, for two pop-up questions one pop-up question will be for uh, step number one and uh, another pop-up question will be for step number two uh, those members or those participants who have not uh, yet downloaded the handouts from go to webinar please do that because when pop-up question will appear you cannot uh, see uh, this slide so having this slide in front of you is sometime important to uh, answer your pop-up question like graham ghosh issues a three percent $200,000 two-year convertible bound at par. The effective rate of interest of the instrument is 8%. The terms of the convertible bound is that the holder of the bond on the redemption date has the option to convert the bound to equity shares at the rate of 10%, 10 shares with a nominal value of $1 per $100 debt rather than being repaid in cash. First requirement is what are the first requirement is what are the future cash flows? Mr. Hayam, can you please write it down? Yes. Uh, what are the future cash flows? What are the future cash flows? Cash flows okay. attached. Attached. To convertible debentures. To convertible debentures. What are the future cash flows attached to convertible convertible debentures? Okay. Yes. Option one. Option one is. 6,000 interest per year and and uh, 200,000 capital repayment capital repayment capital repayment option 2 option 2 16,000 16,000 16, interest payment and 200,000 capital repayment. Capital repayment. Please, pop it up. The question has been popped up. All in this should participate. Please participate in this small question because uh, earlier we got very discouraging response like only 47% uh, participants were correct. This should not happen because this is a very basic concept and this basic concept has not changed maybe from last two decades because there are many changes in the financial instruments but so far as this concept is concerned this is this is the same for the last more than 20 years so far 12 percent people have voted uh, I think the person have already been with the participants. 30 seconds are left. Okay, 
15 seconds left now so uh, those parties friends or attendees who are working on it please submit their question uh, uh, please submit their answer right away as i am going to close it in a bit only five seconds now please come up with your answers okay so i am going to close this one uh 70 70 percent people saying six thousand interest payment and two hundred thousand capital repayment while uh 30 percent people saying 16,000 interest payment per year and 200,000 capital repayment. Okay, 70% are correct. So at least the figure moved from 47% to 70%, I'm happy. But the rest of the 30% should also come with the right answer. See, I again repeat. See, what is the confusion? The confusion is, should we apply uh, that 3% or 8% uh, to the to the face value of this debt for the determination of uh, the interest payment. So far as the capital repayment is concerned, that is that is the same in both options. So this was in fact uh, like a point that need to be decided. See, remember, actual interest payment will always be made on the coupon rate or the nominal rate, which is 3%. Actual cash payment will always be made on the coupon rate of interest or the nominal rate of interest, which is in this case 3%. When you, when you apply this 3% to 200,000, which is the face value of your instrument, this will give you the uh, actual cash outflow related to the interest payment. So 70% people are uh, correct. Okay, uh, step number two is what we will do, we will simply apply the effective interest rate. We will apply the effective interest rate here in this case, see, there are only two years, year one, year two. Cash outflows are 6,000, year one, and in year two, 6,000 plus 200,000, mean principal repayment as well. So these are our cash outflows, and discount factor will always be based on effective or market interest rate, which is 8% in this case. So this is for year one, this factor, and for year two, or you can uh, see the present value table as well. Uh, so this will give us some figure here, some figure here. When we add up these two, this will give us uh, 182, 182167. So this is basically data. This is basically debt element and equity element will be equity element will be the amount received minus debt element. This will give us uh, 200,000 minus 182167. This will give us 17833. So the double entry will be debit, say cash, or bank. 200,000 and credit debt element. Financial liability, which is one eight two one six seven one six seven and credit equity element with the amount calculated one seven eight double three. So this is the uh, double entry. Okay. 
So let's move. Trading shares. Trading shares. This is a small concept. Trading shares if an entity reacquires its own equity instruments. Those shares are normally termed as uh, treasury shares and shall be deducted from equity. No gain or loss shall be recognized in profit or loss on the purchase, sale, issue or cancellation of an e entity's on equity instrument. Consideration paid or received shall be recognized directly in equity. Then disclosures. See, disclosures related to financial instruments will be covered in International Financial Reporting Standard 7. There are no disclosures in International Accounting Standard 32. The disclosure related to treasury shares are in International Accounting Standard 1, Presentation of Financial Statement, and International Accounting Standard 24, related parties for share repurchase purchases from uh, related parties. So this was all about uh, International Accounting Standard 32. We shall be having a short break and uh, there are once uh, we resume after break, uh, we will be ready to take your question related to International Accounting standard 32 before moving to the other side. Thank you.
Okay, uh, questions are, Khayam, can you please uh, read this question one by one? Okay, let me check with them. If you have, the uh, rest we can. Okay. Uh, so let me. Adil Niaz saying, I could not listen, there is no sound, but Adil, we were on break. Uh, Swan Yusuf, circumstances in which entity purchases its own shares. Please give example. Mohammed Ahmed again, no sound. Uh, for people saying no sound, we were on break. See, Usman, uh, sometime uh, you can utilize your excessive cash for buying back your own shares to improve the earning per share and like this. So this is an example. Use, usage of excess cash. Next. Okay. So... Okay, now the yeah. next uh, next standard. And that is International Financial Reporting Standard 9, Financial uh, Instruments. See, before uh, going into the details, Let's have a look at uh, important terminologies, uh, which will keep on uh, coming back uh, in, in this standard. Number one is amortized cost. See, amortized cost of a financial asset or a financial liability is the amount at which the financial asset or liability is measured at initial recognition, minus principal repayments, plus or minus the cumulative amortization of any difference between the initial amount and the maturity amount and minus any write downs for impairment or uncollectability. See, this is the definition of the uh, amortized cost. Then the next definition is effective interest method. See, the effective interest method is a method of calculating the amortized cost of a financial instrument and of allocating the interest income or interest expense over the relevant period. The effective interest rate is the rate that exactly discounts estimated future cash payments or receipts through the expected life of the financial instrument to the net carrying amount of the financial asset or liability. So this is the effective interest rate. Is the rate that exactly discounts estimated future cash payments or receipts through the expected life of the financial instrument to the net carrying amount of the financial asset or liability. Okay, these were the important terminology. If uh, need be, uh, we will uh, we will we can uh, relook at these uh, important terminologies. See. Uh, under IFRS 9, we shall be discussing uh, accounting treatment of equity instruments, uh, accounting treatment of financial liabilities, accounting treatment of financial assets. Thereafter, of course, we shall be discussing impairment concept and hedging. So these will also be uh, discussed. See, first of all, let's start with a very simple uh, concept equity uh, instruments. See, equity instruments are uh, initially measured at fair value, less any issue cost. In many legal jurisdictions, when equity shares are uh, issued, they are recorded at a nominal value, with the excess consideration received recorded in a share premium account, and uh, the issue cost being written off against the share premium. Subsequently, the equity instruments are not remembered. Okay, so this is uh, a simple uh, treatment for the equity instrument. Only initially you will have to apply the fair value uh, less any issue cost, and uh, subsequently you will uh, not remember equity instruments. 
So let's look at financial liabilities. See, financial liabilities, uh, there are two measurements, subsequent measurement for financial liability and initial measurement. Subsequent measurement, your, your policy about subsequent measurement, mean your initial measurement will depend on how are you going to uh, measure that financial liability subsequently. So that's why I have mentioned uh, subsequent measurement uh, at the start of this slide. In fact, practically you will be uh, you will be uh, measuring your financial liability initially, and uh, subsequently you will be applying the material which is uh, appearing at the start of the uh, slide. See, initial measurement. Initial measurement. Fair value, if subsequently it will be measured at fair value through profit or loss. And fair value less issue cost, if it will be subsequently measured at amortized cost. There is a small difference of issue cost. If that financial liability will be subsequently measured at amortized cost, then you will reduce the fair value by issue cost. You will reduce the fair value by issue cost. But if subsequently you will be measuring the financial liability at fair value through profit and uh, profit or loss, then uh, initially that financial liability will be measured at fair value. Now come come to the initial measurement. Is it automatic or is there any rule? See the rule is. If there are certain conditions, if there are certain conditions, then you will measure financial liability at fair value through profit or loss. But, but if none of the conditions is there, then you will be uh, measuring that financial liability at amortized cost. So this means you just need to memorize what should be there in order uh, to measure the financial liability at fair value through profit or loss. If those conditions are not there, this means that financial liability will be measured at amortized cost. See. If it is held for trading, then that financial liability will be subsequently measured at fair value through profit or loss. Or uh, upon initial recognition, the financial liability is designated at fair value through uh, profit or loss. This is permitted when it results in more relevant information because it eliminates or significantly reduces a measurement or recognition inconsistency. Accounting this much. Okay, let me repeat it. Two, if it is held for trading, that financial liability uh, will be measured at fair value through profit, profit or loss. Or at initial recognition, you are uh, you decided you designated that this will be subsequently measured at fair value through profit or loss because otherwise this will result in accounting mismatch. And then uh, all derivatives are always measured at fair value through profit or loss. If we just ignore the discussion of derivatives. Uh, non-derivative financial instrument, uh, all other uh, non-derivative financial instrument, you will measure them at amortized cost. And for derivatives, uh, those will always be measured at fair value through profit and loss. Okay. Now, what we concluded here, very simple. 
very simple. We can view it. Like if this is for this treatment is for held for trading financial liabilities. Number one, or number two. Uh, this treatment will result in more information. For example, will avoid Accounting mismatch, accounting mismatch. So this means except these two, all other amortized cost, all other amortized costs. Just remember this for financial. Aid. This means you just need to remember these two things. If none of these is there, then this, this should be your measurement basis, amortized cost. So this is the default position in fact. This is the default position. So this is the way you will be deciding about the measurement policy. Okay. No, let, let's discuss about the accounting mismatch. What is this? What is the accounting mismatch, in fact? See, the accounting mismatch is, in fact, uh, okay, if an entity holds a financial asset, that is debt and that carries a fixed rate of interest. Fixed rate of interest. That is debt that carries a fixed rate of interest. But is then hedged with an interest rate swap that swaps the fixed rates for floating rates. See, the interest rate swap is a financial instrument that would be held at fair value through profit or loss. And so accordingly, the financial asset classified as debt also needs to be at fair value through profit or loss to ensure that the gains and the losses arising from both instruments are naturally paired in income and thus reflect the substance of the hedge. This means if you have a financial liability, if you have a financial liability at fixed rate of interest but uh, subsequently you hedged it with an interest rate swap that swaps the fixed rate for floating rate the interest rate swap is a financial instrument that would be held at fair value through profit or loss and so accordingly the financial liability classified uh, financial liability needs to be at fair value through profit or loss to ensure that the gains and losses arising from financial liability and uh, interest rate swap are naturally paired in income and this reflects the substance of the hedge. But if you subsequently measure your financial liability at amortized cost but the interest rate swap is being measured of course that will be measured uh, at fair value through profit or loss so this will result in an accounting mismatch in order to avoid this accounting mismatch uh, uh, it is recommended you will be 
uh, measuring both the hedged item and the hedging instrument uh, at fair value through profit or loss. So this is the point number two. Okay. Uh, sir, we have some questions. Yes, please. Uh, Sarah Thomas asked to please give an example for financial liabilities held for trading. Financial liabilities uh, held for uh, trading. Sarah, uh, right now I cannot uh, recall any example, but subsequently, if it comes to my mind, of course, definitely I'll be sharing with you. Thanks. Okay, Muhammad Salman, you sir. Can you kindly give an example of accounting mismatch? Uh, Muhammad Salman, I explained it uh, in very detail. I suppose your question is before this explanation. Yes, around five. Okay. okay. Then, then next question. I, I, I hope your question is already answered. All questions have been answered. Okay. Then let's move further. Okay, illustration number one, amortized cost. This is the illustration. A company raises finance by issuing 20,000 6% four year loan notes on the first day of the current accounting period. The loan notes are issued at a discount of 10% and will be redeemed after four years at a premium of $1,015. The effective rate of interest is 12%. The issue costs were 1,000. Explain and illustrate how the loan is accounted for in the financial statements of the company. So this is the requirement. Here you can see that here we can see that like this will subsequently be measured at amortized cost. This will be subsequently measured at amortized cost. So what are the other facts? Other facts are other facts are like uh, See, this is the 20,000. This is the face value. But because you have issued these bounds at discount, this mean 10% discount mean, in fact, you received 18,000 in cash. This is the receipt and then there is an issue cost which is 1000 which is 1000 1000 see we know uh, from our earlier slide the financial liability which will subsequently be measured at amortized cost, the initial measurement will be the net of these two figures. So this means this financial liability will initially be measured at 17,000. This is the fair value. In fact, cash received is the fair value. This is the fair value which we in fact received and less 1000 if we if we were required to measure this uh, financial liability subsequently at fair value through profit or loss then on initial measurement we would not have reduced this 18000 by this 1000 we know this from uh, earlier slide Okay, this is the 17,000 which will be uh, 
uh, used for subsequent calculation. Okay. For other, for like if we just see what will happen subsequently. Okay, we know for sure 17,000. 17,000 will be the amount on initial recognition. So we can use uh, an empty like uh, document to illustrate this concept. We can come over here. See, this means year one, years, like it has got four year life, one, two, three, four. So the opening balance, OB mean opening balance, we know we recognized it at 17,000 after uh, reducing it by the issue cost. Then profit and loss charge mean finance, finance charge. This charge will always be calculated at the effective rate of interest or the market rate of interest less cash paid and we know from our discussion on international accounting standard 32 cash will always be paid uh, using the coupon rate of interest which is in this case 60 percent to the face value face value is 20 20 000. so this way we shall be calculating the cash paid. So here in this case, this will give us 1200. This is the amount of cash which we have paid and effective interest rate as given in the question is 12%. When we will apply 12% uh, to the amount, so this will give us 17, 12%. So this will give us 2040. But here important point is like for uh, for this calculation for this calculation if i highlight it over here is this is basically effective rate of interest into opening bands whereas for 1200 this is the calculation for 1200 simply multiply the coupon rate of interest with the face value. These are the small points uh, which make big difference in your calculation. If you correctly memorize these small concepts, so you can, you can uh, correctly apply uh, to your practical situations. So then, this, then we will reach the closing balance. So closing balance will be very simple add this these two and then minus this so this will give us one seven eight four zero this will be your liability bifurcated into current and long-term portion this will be appearing in your statement of financial position this will be appearing in your statement of financial position so this will become the opening balance of uh, second year again we shall be applying on this opening balance uh, effective interest rate this will give us 2141 and this is the 1200 this will give us 18781 then 18781 again the same principle which we discussed earlier and this will give us 19 eight three five likewise one nine eight three five will become opening balance and this is the calculation of the effective interest rate and here the amount paid is in fact twelve hundred plus two one zero one five if you just look at the information of the question you will find that this is basically because we committed with them that we shall be like uh, 
paying them uh, the principal plus a premium of 1015. I suppose this is the figure given over there. And at the end, you will uh, you will have no liability. So these amounts will be charged to the profit and loss account. These are basically profit and loss account charge related to uh, this financial liability. Whereas uh, this is the this is the statement of uh, financial position as I mentioned over here this is basically the statement of financial position uh, at the end of year one statement of financial position financial ability year two year three year four but of course this will be bifurcated into current and long term portion this will be bifurcated into current and long term portion and wherever these two portions are there but in at the end of third year, of course, only one portion will be there, which is the current portion long term, because this whole amount will be paid within a period of 12 months. Okay, this is the illustration of this is the illustration of amortized costs. Okay, now come back to our uh, slides. Next is the illustration of uh, fair value through profit or loss. See, the illustration is on 1st January 2011, A Limited issued three year 5% 30,000 loan notes. Should be in front of me as well. Let me okay. Loan notes at nominal value when the effective rate of interest is also five percent. The loan notes will be redeemed at par. The liability is classified at fair value through profit or loss. At the end of the first accounting period, market interest rates have risen to six percent. Six percent required explain and illustrate how the loan is accounted for in the financial statement of a limited in the year ended 31st december 2011 before going into the uh, uh, discussion we can we can uh, have a look at some of the information given in the question see here you can see that Uh, 30,000 is received, 30,000 is received and this is the face value as well. And what is the coupon rate of interest? Coupon rate of interest is Coupon rate is 5% given, 5%. Mean if I want to calculate the actual cash outflows, I will be applying this 5% to this 30,000. Whereas question says 5% is also effective rate of interest. So coupon rate of interest is 5% and effective rate of interest is also 5%. So because this financial lab, there is no uh, issue cost. I don't see any issue cost in the question. Had it been, there, uh, had it been uh, there, we would have ignored it because this is the financial liability which will be subsequently, which will be subsequently measured at fair value through profit or loss. And we know that for such liability, for such liability, uh, you should uh, initially measure it at fair value only, and the fair value here is thirty thousand. So this means this financial liability will initially be measured at thirty thousand. 
this will be initially measured at 30,000. Now what happened? The same way this will become our opening balance. If you just go back to uh, Word doc, we just go back to Word doc. See here in this case, here in this case, let me go to a fresh page so that I could have space over here. See again here it will become opening balance. Uh, year. Say here we have how many years we have here. Here we have I suppose. Okay, we are required to perform the calculation only for the first year. That will be enough to uh, explain this concept to differentiate it from those financial liability which are subsequently measured at our tax cost. Okay, so here is. 2011 and on 1st January 2011 mean opening balance as we have just discussed this will become 30,000 then is the finance charge finance charge how we will calculate it of course opening balance into effective interest rate in so we shall be multiplying five percent because effective interest rate is also five percent so five percent will be multiplied to the uh, thirty thousand so this will give us a figure of fifteen hundred so this is the finance charge then cash paid we know that this cash paid will be on the face value, which is 30,000 into coupon rate of interest or nominal rate of interest, coupon rate, which is again 5%. So this will again give us 1500. So uh, liability will become closing liability will become 30,000. At this point in time, we can see from our uh, question information, like there is a change in the effective interest rate, which is now 6%. There is a change in the effective interest rate, which is now 6%. So at this point in time, mean on 31st December 2011, you will calculate the fair value of this financial liability using 6% as a discount rate. Using 6% as a discount rate. The method is very simple. Just, just determine what are the actual cash flows subsequent to the to 31st December 2011 and because its total life is uh, total life is three years I suppose it is three years let me check is it is it three years or something else yes I suppose it is three years okay three years so this means only two years are left mean 2012 and 2013 two years are left and simply we need to see okay this mean what will be the cash flows cash flows actual cash flows in 2012 at the end of 2012 mean 31st December 2012, 1500, 
and then on 31st december the last year of this uh, of its life 1500 plus uh, the capital uh, repayment which is 30000 multiply these two figures with the revised discount rate effective rate which is 6% so for this year the discount factor will be this and for this year the discount factor will be 1.06 raised to power 2 so this will give us 1415 and uh, this will give us 28035 so in total 29450 so this is the fair value fair value of this liability liability as at 31st December 2011 see the concept is very simple you want to determine the fair value at 31st December 2011 simply from date from that date onward uh, in second year and third year but for uh, from the point of view of 31st december 2011 2012 is now first year and 2013 is now second year and in second year 1500 plus capital repayment. and now so these are the cash outflows actual cash outflows subsequent to 31st December 2011 then discount these actual cash outflows by using the revised effective interest rate market interest rate which is now 6% which is now 6% so this will give you the fair value of this liability at 31st December 2011. Please note this figure because when I write something on slide, this will be saved in recording. But when I will move uh, to my Word document, so uh, this this will uh, the system will raise this raise this uh, information. So what is the fair value of this liability? 29,450. You know what I will do next? What I will do, I will see what is the difference. See, this was your liability. But we have calculated uh, 29,450. This is the fair value. Now the difference between these two will, will be sent to the profit or loss. 550. Sorry? 550. 550. Okay, thank you very much. This will be taken to the profit or loss. And this green amount will be will appear in the statement of an action position. Of course, bifurcated into current and long term portion. Likewise, every year, now from next onward. This calculation will be based on 6%, the revised effective interest rate. And likewise, you will continue. 
and uh, whenever there is a change in the effective interest rate whenever there is a change in the effective interest rate you will uh, uh, do the calculation as we did for the uh, determination of the fair value of your financial liability if we have uh, any question related to this calculation so no, we can answer them now no uh, not to this question but some questions are there can you kindly share the answers to the calculations asked by Parameshir and uh, shouldn't the premium be considered in cal calcul calculating fair value Mirza Bay? Uh, Mr. Bay, uh, if we just uh, look back, we have done that. See, in the last year, see here, if we just go back to the calculation where uh, premium was involved, here you can see that we have taken here 21,050, uh, and this 21,000 is after the incorporation of the premium. Mirza, I hope it is clear. Good um, afternoon. If an entity maintains the policy of provision for doubtful debt, for the total trade receivables, then this connect with IS 37. And similarly, if recoverable debt will lead to deregulation as per IFRS 15 in the context of subsequent measurement. What is the main objective or contribution of IS 32 or IFRS 9 in connection with the treatment or measurement of trade receivables or trade payables? Uh, Burhanuddin, what I gathered, uh, gathered from your question, you mentioned that perhaps allowance for or premium for doubtful debt is treated under IC 37. This is not the case. Uh, though we use the word premium, but this word is not appropriate. Uh, that's why you uh, like uh, related it to International Accounting Standard 37. In fact, the word should be allowance for doubtful debt. This is purely an impairment of your uh, debt. And that is... Uh, uh, that is dealt under IFRS 9 and we shall be discussing it uh, under impairment, impairment of your uh, debtors. So that is not, uh, that will not be uh, dealt with under International Accounting Standard 37. So please make it clear. So I hope uh, I answered your question properly. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is This was basically the fair value. Now, next concept is the de-recognition of financial liabilities. We discussed the recognition of financial liabilities. So let's discuss the de-recognition of financial liabilities. This is very important concept and we shall be discussing this concept uh, with the help of of course uh, a practical illustration see a financial liability is de-recognized when it is extinguished that is when the obligation specified in the contract is discharged or cancelled cancelled or expires so here uh, we have the guideline, rather I would uh, make it two for more clarification. See, this is not the third point in fact. This is basically, in total there are two points in fact. And these are, these two uh, write-ups related to these two points. Okay. See, derecognition. Number one, where an existing borrower and lender of debt instruments exchange on financial instrument for another with substantially different terms, substantially different terms, this is accounted for as an extinguishment of the original financial liability and the recognition of a new financial liability. Mean your Financer has replaced your existing debt with, with a new debt with a substantially different terms. 
interest rate like uh, terms of the loan and then premium or discount or whatever other terms that are substantially different so you should uh, de-recognize your existing liability and you will recognize uh, the new liability where this is the case We spend here, so this will give us some okay, I can use from here. Mm. Substantially different terms. Mr. Ham, can we move uh, this uh, place of yes, we can uh, uh, like your screen mouse. because this is causing problem for from mouse. Uh, please give me the mouse. Okay. Uh, actually, mouse. Uh, will become your uh, just give me the mouse. Okay. No, move it to the upper left. Move it to the upper left. Okay, okay, fine. Now it's fine. So now I'll have to select the pen again. Yes. Okay, so fine. Thank you. See, substantially different terms. Very simple. So this means you will de-recognize your existing liability. Okay, now move to number two, which is a little more technical. A substantial modification of the terms of an existing financial liability or a part of it should be accounted for as an extinguishment of the original financial liability and recognition of a new financial liability. If there is a modification, of the terms. Now, what is the modification? When that modification will be substantial? When that modification will be substantial? Here is a criteria. Here is a criteria. You can see that when uh, the present value of cash flows, the present value of cash flows using original effective interest rate and present value of cash flows uh, using effective interest rate at the date of inception mean you will be calculating your financial level cash flows related to financial liabilities by applying two different discount factors the original effective interest rate if there is a difference of 10 percent between these two amount then this will be taken as if it is a substantial modification if it is a substantial modification okay let's understand with the help of an illustration so it is better uh, uh, that we should use some empty document because a lot of mess is created on that and it is restrictive as well then Next is the accounting treatment of this. The difference between the carrying amount of financial liability and uh, the like new uh, liability will be uh, recognized in profit and loss. Okay, let's. You people have uh, this illustration which I am going to discuss uh, now. Okay, we have here illustration. I suppose this is the folder. Yes, this is the illustration. See, during 2000, let me make it a little large. Yes. During the year 
ended December 31st, 2008. A Pakistani sugar company, PSC, was facing severe problems in meeting its obligations. In October 2008, PSC commenced negotiations with the lender for restructuring of loan. Following is a summary of the liabilities of the company as of December 31st, 2008, prior to making adjustments on restructuring. Loan amount, 28 million. So let me keep it in front of me as well. Okay. So 28 million. This is the carrying amount. Okay, where is uh, the length of time? Where is the length? Uh, here it is. So this is the carrying value of our financial liability. Carrying amount. Okay. The loans are repayable. Okay. What are the other facts? The other facts are, yes, it, these are here. In October 2008, PSC commenced negotiation with the lender for restructuring of law. Following is a summary of the liabilities of the company as of December 31st, 2008, prior to making adjustments on restructuring, restructuring of law. So this is the carrying value of that law. Okay, remaining number of installment including interest rate markup of 2.5. The loans are repayable. The loans are repayable in equal annual installment. Agreement with SBD was finalized and signed before the year end. Following is the information in respect of rescheduling uh, agreement. This is the revised value of loan. Revised value of loan. This is the revised value. And this is revised present value as per the original effective interest rate. And this is the revised present value as per the market interest rate. Okay. So now as a result of this restructuring, we will be comparing the carrying value of the liability. What was that? As we seen at the start of uh, the question, carrying value of uh, liability was was 28 million this was the carrying value. i mean this is the amount appearing in a, in our account before the incorporation of the effect of any restructuring now when we restructured this loan so what is the revised value this is the revised value. Revised present value as per the original effective interest rate. Now we shall be calculating the difference between these two figures. This figure and this figure. The difference is... Uh, Hayam, can you... 3, 1, 2... Minus 28 the difference is basically 3 to 3.2 million this is the difference 
So this difference is in fact 11.43%. Difference between the carried amount immediately before the incorporation of the restructuring effect and the revised present value as per the original effective interest rate. If this difference is more than 10%, so this restructuring will be treated as this is a substantial modification of the law. In this case, you will de-recognize it and you will recognize this law, the, which is a failure. The difference between these two, so far as this figure is concerned, this is only for the purpose of calculation of uh, the difference to see whether it is more than 10% or not. If it is less than 10%, then the existing liability will not be extinguished. But now, because this difference is more than 10%, this existing liability will be extinguished extinguished mean we shall be de-recognizing it and the entry will be entry will be debit debit old loan from SBD account 28 million and credit new loan loan from SBD and this is new loan account at fair value of course don't confuse it with that 31 point something million because whenever you recognize initially recognize your uh, financial liability we learned during this session that that will be recognized at fair value so this is the fair value the difference will be the difference will be debited to the profit or loss this is the difference between these two amount so this is all about uh, financial liability and uh, uh, starting from uh, initial measurement and then subsequent measurement and then uh, rules uh, so far as the de-recognition of financial liability is concerned. We shall be having a short break and then uh, we shall be resuming from the same point.
Dah cerita lah macam lah Okay uh, Okay So if uh, you people have any question uh, Please uh, ask now And uh, And uh, we can move to Our next uh, Presentation Okay. Uh, can you uh, just see if we have any question? Because we have finished with uh, a, sub, uh, a substantial area. How this 11.43 question comes? Please explain because uh, I could not get. Can you please sit if you have, we have any other questions? Because we are left with few minutes in uh, which if we have, if you people have any question, please ask it now, so that before moving to the next area we are we should be very clear okay the question is like how we have calculated see uh, the difference between these two is 3.2 so this is the carrying amount so we have calculated 11.5 percent 31.5 minus 28 million divided by 28 million into 100%. I suppose I mentioned the correct number of uh, zeros, but it should be 6. This should be 6. In yes, fact, 28 million. Uh, should be seven. Seven. Okay. What should I do? I should use the razor, but I'm afraid that this will take us. Okay, okay. so 28 million into 100 percent. This will give us 11.43 uh, percent. Uh, is it clear? Can I please check if it's clear or not? Yes, this is around 11.428%. Okay, then this is clear. Yes, this is correct. Okay. Okay, should I move? Okay, fine. See, we discussed international accounting standard 32. I deliberately uh, postponed one concept in the compound instrument which you normally uh, face uh, practically and that is related to the issue cost what we learned we learned that a compound uh, instrument is subdivided into the debt element and the equity element and the illustrations which we used to explain this concept no issue cost was involved Now, what happened if issue cost is involved? Because when you bifurcate your compound instrument into the debt element and the equity element, and that debt element is in fact your financial liability. And if that financial liability is subsequently being measured at amortized cost, which is not really the case, what about the issue cost? Because that issue cost is not only related to is not only related to uh, the debt element, but uh, also it uh, relates to the uh, equity element as well. So what will be the treatment subsequently of this issue cause and how uh, it will affect the measurement at initial recognition. So this is uh, uh, our small discussion related to this area, in fact. Okay. So we can use an example to, to discuss this point 
of issue cost. So I can use the space over here. Okay. See, suppose on the uh, 1st July 2011, 1st July 2011, uh, 2 million convertible departures. See, I should mention this information over here. 1st July 2000. 1st July 2011. 2 million convertible debentures of 100 each were, uh, were issued. 2 million 100 mean, in fact, in total we collected 200 million. Okay. Each debenture is convertible into 25 ordinary shares. How many debentures? 2 million debentures. And uh, rupees 100 is the face value of each debenture. So this is the basic information. And uh, each debenture of 100 can be converted into converted into like uh, 25 shares or you can receive cash of rupees I suppose uh, I am assuming here there is no uh, discount or premium rupees cent. So this is the company. Now what happened? Uh, interest is payable annually in arrears at the rate of 8%. So this means coupon rate of interest is 8%. This is the coupon rate of interest. Okay. On the date of issue, market interest rate for similar debt without conversion option was 11%. So this is the coupon rate of interest. And we know that this rate will be used for the calculation of actual cash flows, coupon rate of interest. And on the same date, effective interest rate is effective interest effective interest rate is 11%. Okay. Uh, issue cost incurred was 4 million. For me. And uh, this increased uh, the effective interest rate to 11.81%. Now, the question is how can we treat uh, this 4 million? on initial measurement and if it has got any effect on subsequent measurement. Okay. Let's solve this uh, small example. This will give us an idea how can we deal with this uh, issue cost. Okay. It should be in front of me as well. Like uh, the question was, in fact, uh, convertible debentures, 2 million convertible 
debentures to meaning convertible debentures. Yes, it is in front of Okay, so how much cash you received? The cash received is, in fact, 196 million because this is the face value and you paid 4 million out of this and you received, in fact, 196 million. So this means cash or bank will be debited with the 196 million. So how can we calculate the present value of the liability? The present value of the liability. So this is important. How can we incorporate this uh, issue cost? See, if for, for a moment, we forget about uh, that there is an issue cost. Okay, if there is no issue cost, I, I suppose this uh, illustration is very clear. If there is no issue cost, first of all, calculate the present value of the debt element. Assuming that there is no issue cost. And then the difference of 200 million and the uh, debt element will become your equity element. Now these are the debt and the equity element without issue cost. Now prorate your issue cost of 4 million among the debt element and the equity element. Based on their value, determined ignoring the issue cost. Now, whatever portion you have allocated out of 4 million to the debt element and the equity element, reduce the debt and the equity element with that allocation. This will give you the debt element and the equity element for, uh, for initial measurement and for passing the general entries in case of issue cost. So, uh, because we uh, we do not have time now, I will try to uh, like uh, solve this small illustration for you and to explain it what I said theoretically. How can we apply that on these figures and what will be the end result uh, at the start of uh, tomorrow uh, session? Thank you very much. If you have any question, you can ask it now. Uh, in the meantime, I think I must pop up the poll regarding feedback about today's session. Yes, please. There is a pop up uh, related to feedback. Your feedback is helpful in, uh, in uh, the improvement of our uh, sessions. Of course, this is uh, encouragement also, this is the true remuneration of all this effort. And uh, thank you very much from my side. And Khayam will continue uh, during this, these last moments. <coughs> <clears throat> so for 18 percent people have voted uh, I must say that uh, more participation is needed from you guys I hope you guys will uh, turn up and participate in this poll question 
as you can see now uh, it's about 1 minute and 20 seconds since the poll have popped up so i'm going to close this poll uh, in a bit so please submit your feedback okay i'm going to close this poll now thank you everyone <clears throat> We have uh, put in one person people saying excellent, rather 53 percent people saying very useful, and six percent people saying good. Thank you. And the uh, uh, trainer have conveyed his thank you to everyone uh, who is attending this session. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to pop up another poll question, and this is about your current. Uh, residing uh, country where you are residing right now. I'm going to launch this question now. Since our last uh, webinars, we have found that uh, approximately uh, participants from Pakistan and uh, Middle East are alike like uh, they are almost same uh, percentage uh, currently <laughs> there is a I must say that there is a challenge between both going neck to neck and the people who are from uh, other area, they must uh, comment in the question box or maybe chat box mentioning their uh, country from where they are uh, currently participating. I am going to clo close this poll question in a bit. I hope you guys uh, will submit so far, we have 19% people who have voted for this. Okay, so I'm going to close this poll question now. Uh, the statistics are that 43% people saying that they are from Pakistan, while 46% people saying that they are from Middle East. So heads off to Middle East that uh, even uh, after being at a distance they are uh, reaching us and they are trying to connect with us while three percent people are from sri lanka seven percent people saying bangladesh and one percent people saying others so i am going to see that uh, okay so no one have indicated that from where uh, nobody have tried to contact us in chat box Okay, thank you everyone and thank you once again from the trainer and uh, I hope you guys will uh, come up again because we have back-to-back -back sessions uh, tomorrow, in fact Thursday and Friday we have back-to-back -back sessions on financial instruments. I hope you guys will uh, come up again and participate. Thank you everyone. Allah Hafiz. Goodbye. Peace be upon Allah.